they did it. Those men and women over at Rockstar Games really made a great piece of entertainment. Red Dead Redemption 2 lived up to the hype and dramatic expectations of consumers and reviewers alike. The game released in late October to widespread critical as well as commercial success. Many players are already projecting the game to be game of the year worthy, right up there with the other obvious contender, the recently rebooted God of War. Of course, there is a great case to be made for Red Dead 2 to receive the accommodation. From the extensive story featuring a multitude of exhilarating action set pieces and interesting character arcs, to the dynamic aspects of its open world that appears lifelike in more ways than one, the game has done many things that no other game this year could compete with. However, I would like to make a case of my own. I know this might be controversial to say, but I don't think Red Dead Redemption 2 is the game of the decade. I don't think it's a masterpiece, and it isn't even the best game I've ever played. Now before I get skewered down in the comments, I do not think Red Dead 2 is a bad game by any means. I just think that there are some rather obvious improvements that could be made in vital parts of the gameplay experience. And I have a few ideas on how it could be done. So without further ado, here are my issues with and suggestions on how to fix 2018's Game of the Year. As it stands, the biggest problem by far with Red Dead Redemption 2 is the progression system. And as such, it will take a large chunk of this video to explain why. Progression is in the lifeblood of the role-playing genre, and as such, it should be one of, if not the most polished aspect of an RPG. Progressing your character by gaining better gear is key in engaging the player and motivating them to progress further in the game. This is not the case for Red Dead 2, and it can be most clearly seen through the way money is gathered and spent in the game. At the beginning of Chapter 2, when the world opens up, players are given $300 to set up their character with. As they progress through story and side objectives, players will accrue more and more wealth, with some missions giving much more than others. One particular story mission, about one third of the way through, nearly breaks the money system entirely. Without going into spoiler territory, at the end of the mission, the player is given an amount of money that they are unlikely to spend all of before the end of the game. The two main money sinks which would be able to handle this large influx of cash are the main camp upgrades and the elite horses. By the point in the game where the, this mission becomes available, the camp is likely close to being fully upgraded, leaving the elite horses to soak up the rest of the additional money. However, the two expensive elite horses do not show up in the stables until after Chapter 4 and Chapter 6. The result is a system breaking amount of money being given to the player less than halfway through the game. Players will rarely find it necessary to loot and sell any gear found in O'Driscoll's again, as each bandit usually only gives 2 to $8 each. You might be thinking, well, I'll just go spend the money at the stores in town then. Surely they have plenty of interesting things to spend money on. And you'd be right, except that you can get everything the stores offer from other sources for cheaper. Looting, for instance, gives consumable items at such a frequent rate that you'll rarely run out and feel the need to go and purchase additional items from the stores. Even irregular looting will leave you with enough food and elixirs to get through any encounters that you could face in Red Dead 2. And if for some reason you feel that it's necessary to stock up on more consumables, the camp upgrades and restocking options provide a much more convenient alternative to riding all the way into town and back. If ammo, food, and elixirs can all be bought en masse from the convenience of your camp, you only really need to go into the stores to sell the extra valuables gathered from looting, such as pocket watches and belt buckles. As fixes go, the progression-breaking story mission could be a rather simple one. My first choice would be to push it back further in the story, which would make the influx of cash much less detrimental to the overall upgrade timeline. However, if the mission was considered absolutely vital to the story in its current position, some deeper reworking of the progression system could also be a viable solution. For example, buying guns from the gunsmith is a rather cheap endeavor for how big of a potential upgrade a new weapon is. $90 here and $120 there isn't taking too much out of your satchel in the grand scheme of things. Plus, it is worth mentioning that the majority of guns are unlocked through story progression for free. This leads to guns not being the satisfying cash dump that they could be. As an alternative, I would propose a base increase in gunsmith prices across the board in combination with unlocking more of the guns for purchase early on in the game. Although not as many guns would be unlocked through pure story progression, players would have more options and sink more of their money in general into the shop. 
This solution also falls in line with the open world mantra of giving the player more choice in their gameplay, rather than forcing story progression in order to get more powerful as a character. Still, even with this fix, the frequency of loot is far too high to justify ever going to the general store or medical store. A reduction to the amount of loot from corpses, as well as camp resupplies, may be the obvious answer to some, but I think another idea could work just as well. If the amount of items players get more conveniently stays the same, there can be specific, powerful items that are exempt from the loot tables that are only available by walking into a store and purchasing them. Say, if Miracle Tonics, an item that restores all the player's cores and solidifies them, no longer drop from any random gang member, but were only sold in doctor's offices. Sure, it would make a greater task for any player to access them, but for those who put the extra effort in, they would be rewarded handsomely with a strong elixir. Having a select few items be accessed through this method would increase the player's desire for them and motivate them to utilize the stores and towns when they otherwise wouldn't have a reason to. More specific examples of the lack of meaningful progression include hunting and challenges, two side systems that are meant to direct open world exploration, but ultimately end up falling flat as there is little motivation to do them at all. As far as hunting goes, there are three main sources of progress that it contributes towards. Money from animal parts, satchel upgrades, and cosmetics for the camp. Cash-wise, even perfect pelts, the most useful crafting items, don't get much from the town butchers, with most other parts selling for less still. As it stands, other forms of gaining money such as robberies and straight up looting dead bodies give magnitudes more revenue than an afternoon of hunting in the plains of East Hanover. Pearson's crafting options do offer a more valuable form of progression for hunting through the satchel upgrades. These can be acquired through gathering perfect pelts from various animals and donating them for inventory upgrades. As it stands though, the base satchel carries plenty of weapons and food to take on any tasks throughout the game with enough extra supplies to make a quick buck at the general store. This leaves the last remaining option for using hunting materials on camp cosmetics. These items include pelt covers and skull mounts that are used to decorate the camp. While possibly being a motivation for other players, I rarely notice these cosmetics, even when doing a multitude of activities around camp. In tandem with this, the optional challenges offer very little in the way of character progression, simply rewarding slight upgrades to the main health, stamina, and deadite cores. And if there ever was a more boring upgrade in video games than plus 10% health or plus 5% sprint time, I truly can't think of it. Both systems are in need of a progression overhaul, and there are numerous ways to go about the changes. I would suggest offering tangible items as rewards for completing hunting, hunting and challenge objectives, rather than static inventory and health improvements. For hunting, adding in a selection of task-specific tools to be acquired would give players motivation to hunt and gain access to them, and if they are cool enough, use them for further hunting, creating a basic feedback loop. Items such as bear traps can already be found in game and could create interesting scenarios for hunting, and new weapons like spears could complement the silent, drawn-out style of hunting that often provides perfect pelts. In a similar fashion, completing challenges in a specific area could give you abilities that line up with the player fantasy those challenges contribute to. Wouldn't it be cool if acting like a bandit and doing the respective challenges made you appear more intimidating to townsfolk and therefore make them more likely to give you their possessions? Or through completing the gambling challenges, you might unlock an ability that let you cheat dealer, the dealer in card games, like in the first Red Dead Redemption. This could be done for every set of challenges until they feel like a more viable task to spend time accomplishing as compared to other objectives players might have. You might think that no game could get as janky as one of Bethesda's pieces of work. I'm looking at you, Fallout 76. But Red Dead 2's control scheme gives even the worst of Fallout glitches a run for their money. At least glitches in a game like Fallout are typically uncommon and one-off events that don't prevent fun for too long. Red Dead's controls, on the other hand, are almost constantly getting in the way of something as inherent to an open-world game as movement and open spaces. You can only run into a tree on your horse so many times before you realize that you can't really be that terrible of a jockey, and spe something has got to be systemically wrong. I mean seriously, you're going to spend a decent chunk of your free roaming time staring at the animation of the horse getting up and waiting to get back on, all because of bad controls. 
Even the basic act of attempting to mount your horse can get misinterpreted, as the same button is used to tackle NPCs. Simply wanting to leave town and go on an adventure can lead to a shootout with the local lawmen, all because some poor chap got a little too close when you were trying to go on your way. Though these mishaps are certainly fun the first few times, they quickly become an irritating, almost buggy interruption to casual cowboy escapades. Of all the problems games can face, controls are probably one of the simplest to fix. In this case, the control scheme suffers from clutter and too many actions being assigned to one trigger. An improvement in button mapping should focus all of the actions in a certain category to one section of the controller. Throw all the combat abilities on the triggers and bumpers, and toss all horse-related actions on the D-pad. Having each part of the controller have its own purpose will prevent the accidental blending of systems that occurs when, for example, you tackle somebody when trying to mount your horse. Additionally, showering up extra buttons for this purpose can be done by maximizing menus. Arthur's journal being on the D-pad may make it more accessible and immersive, but it also takes up valuable retail that can be used for more key functions. Placing it in a menu would still allow players to experience it while decluttering the overall control scheme. My final point in relation to controls involves how travel is tediously controlled. Tapping the same button over and over to ramp up run or gallop speed is not only extremely boring, but also physically stressful on the player's hands. Finding an alternative to this mash style gameplay is imperative due to Red Dead 2's focus on travel around its large landscape. Another possibility could be a generous timing-based system that allows for a speed boost every once in a while with a single button press. Riding your horse isn't supposed to be the most taxing part of the game, so why should it feel like it? And while these may appear to be small issues, their constant presence diminishes the quality of the moment-to-moment -moment open world gameplay. Oh boy, here comes Red Dead Redemption 2, the most realistic cowboy simulator ever. Only in his lifelike of a game like this can there be a feature that lets your horse steal your weapons. The same horse that can carry 30-something guns behind the same satchel, while you can only carry four max at a time for maximum realism. Although this is one basic example, this kind of design contradiction permeates every facet of everything you can do in this game. What I am dubbing the realism paradox runs counter to what I believe many players were expecting from Red Dead 2 in terms of a blend between realism and entertainment. It is clear to see that one of Rockstar's main design goals was trying to perfect this blend after playing through the game, with some gamers touting that it's too realistic to be entertaining and others saying it's not realistic enough for their tastes. It is also clear that this balance is a difficult one to accomplish. The primary problem here is the lack of consistency in what should be more realistic for immersive purposes and what should be made less realistic for convenience purposes. Traveling around in your horse, for example, is a process that takes a realistic amount of time as the player travels between points of interest. This benefits the game's open world design as the player can be attracted to new and interesting objectives very literally off the beaten path. Later in the game, fast travel is made accessible at camp for a price for players who want to bypass the lengthy travel times, in addition to the stagecoaches and trains located in towns. It may not appear as convenient as it initially seems though, as although you can travel away from back or between cities, once you're in the wilderness, you are on your own. And there's a whole lot of wilderness on display here. It can be seen that this implementation of fast travel was attempting to add convenience to a more realistic, drawn-out process. However, it does not allow players to skip travel altogether, even after players have helped out enough random strangers to see all of the random encounters. Instead, as players near the end of the game, an unlockable, more lenient fast travel system would allow players the option of getting into the action more quickly, while skipping the, at this point, monotonous travel. Allowing players to fast travel back to camp from far off areas would allow for greater engagement and ease of access. Some may say that players wouldn't experience the open world like the developers intended if fast travel were more convenient than it already is. However, by the late stages of the story, it is likely that players have seen most of the random encounters to face on the road anyways. There are only so many times I can save a woman under a horse and bring her back to town before it becomes a tiresome chore I'm willing to pass up. And fast travel will still be optional, allowing those who prefer riding their steed everywhere they go to continue on as they always have. Another aspect of the game where this realism paradox can be seen is the aforementioned gun-toting and stealing ability of Arthur's horse. Arthur is deemed not worthy enough to be a one-man army, as so many other video game protagonists have. 
as it would simply not be realistic for a cowboy to haul around ten revolvers, five rifles, and three shotguns. But apparently, his horse was blessed by the gods with almighty strength and carrying capacity, because he can carry a whole arsenal on his back. Or more specifically, his side. I can see why restricting Arthur's gun inventory to four would increase realism and immersion, but it immediately breaks this immersion when he can go to his horse and select any gun that ever existed in the Wild West. This also leads to trouble when there's a specific weapon you need for an encounter, but have to scroll through the entire list of guns to find your desired firearm. On top of this, Arthur's horse can steal his weapons before he gets off and leave him in the middle of a gunfight with nothing more than a measly varmint rifle to take on a gang of attackers. I can see that this is not an intentional part of the developer's realistic vision, but it still disrupts the consistency of gameplay that is partly based on in reality. A simplified take on this weapon system could make for a more immersive and less frustrating experience. For starters, I believe the amount and type of weapons Arthur can carry is sufficient for most situations and a larger stock isn't necessary. As for his trusty steed, a smaller amount of weapons to carry, say, four pistols and two large weapons, like rifles and shotguns, would be a helpful inclusion for multiple reasons. First, it would fit more in line with the amount of guns Arthur can carry, lending to a more grounded and realistic feel for the horse and its mechanics. Additionally, it would cut down on the weapon cycling that takes place every time you need to find the perfect gun for the job, as you won't be carrying every weapon in the game everywhere you go. And where would the guns you, and your, you or your horse wouldn't be carrying go, you might ask? They'd feel right at home next to the ammo resupply in Arthur's tent, ready for you to swap out whenever you feel. In this case, you wouldn't need to carry around every repeater if you just got a bolt-action rifle and prefer the power over speed advantage. And all those unique variants of weapons that might only contribute to a unique amount of horse baggage? Well, pick the few you need and leave the rest back at camp for when you might need them later. For Arthur's random inventory issue, the best fix would be to just to lock weapons to him when they are selected, rather than allow them to revert to another loadout variant. I suspect that there may be more technical aspects to this fix, however, as it seems like a pretty understandable complaint for both immersion breaking and simply frustrating reasons alike. As I bring my argument to a close, I'd like to mention that Red Dead Redemption 2 is a great game in my eyes, probably the best I've played this year. Let it be known that I don't have a PS4 to play God of War yet, though. As such, I would like to see it succeed in as many areas as possible, so that it can be made to be the best game it can possibly be. These fixes, though a start, are not even close to the entirety of the things that could be used in bit of tweaking in this gigantic game. And with the addition of Red Dead Online, it looks like the developers have a lot of work to do on that front as well, with it being very clear that the economy is in need of some sweet, sweet TLC. I hope that the points that I have brought up will ma be made into reality in the near future, but only time will truly tell. Let me hear what you think of my suggestions in the comments below, and tell me what you'd change about what many are calling the best game ever made.